This meeting is being recorded. Right. Okay. So, hi, welcome back. This is the second episode, I guess, of Book Club Reviews. And today we'll be reviewing the Book Club of the Month or the book of the month for the month of December. It is Once Upon a River, which is back here. I'm not going to hold it because it's going to be a lot of waving it around. <laughs> Joining me is wonderful Jonathan, as uh, per usual, as the one time that we've done this before. So it's uh, it's already a usual. I guess we'll get right off into it. And for a brief summary of the book, it is about a little tavern in uh in 100 year old ago England and basically we're we're telling a story and the story is very odd and mysterious because a girl which was brought in from drowned from the river and thought dead comes back alive and the story surrounds her uh and everything that goes on with all the people who think they have a connection with her did I summarize that right Johnny <laughs> Uh, as near near about yeah. <laughs> basic premise of the book tell me what how would you like what did you like about the book non-spoilery for the people who haven't read the book yet but how did mm. you think and what did you think about the book the book is a sort of very lovely but different way of 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 writing and telling story it feels very very thematic like you're hearing an, a tale from your your elders around a fire or something it's very it's written in a very sort of segmented but fascinating style um the story itself whilst it does you know drag in places and it takes the long way around to get somewhere a lot of the time um often filling areas of the book with 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 parts where it's both the characters thinking but also leaving you to think about what happens next kind of thing mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but the story itself is pretty captivating it changes it twists in places you didn't think it would uh you you everything that gets revealed about different characters feels for the most part in most characters cases quite satisfying as an ending for there um mm -hmm. everything sort of weaves itself together in in such a way that whilst in modern times in, a, in 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 today's world you might think it's a little bit too coincidental in places <laughs> in in and an in old timey 1800s england in a little village in the middle of nowhere on the thames and the upper thames that is i it's kind of everyone knows everyone so you kind of it does start to make sense that <laughs> such and such would know such and such or would yeah. have seen this yeah. um it's just a lovely book i think um the ending sells it for me um okay there's like one thing we're both unhappy about <laughs> but at the same time it's still it's a very well-rounded book and i can see why it was a a good seller it certainly seems like the kind of thing you'd bring with you on holiday or something and if you gave yourself a project to read and you you wanted yeah. something to feel cozy whilst having a winter break yeah. Perfect book for that. Yeah. I completely agree with you. I think thematically I would read this book during the winter, which is why I'm very happy that we did do that during the winter. Mm. Um personally, I think I agree with you. The ending was very satisfying. So if you're seeking or looking for a book that pays off in the end, I think this is a good book to to pick up. Um definitely uh, likes the part about the magical realism that was very nice addition and it also is just subtle enough that you're like well there's a there's a reason for everything to happen but also magic so that was mm. pretty cool um and i think that the book really as you said really did well the storytelling aspect which is woven both inside the story itself as well as the way that it was told um Obviously, one of my, my small gripes with the book is that it's a bit slow in places. So I think this is not for for anyone who wants to have like a, a swizzy read, a speed through um, mm. through something, because I think it's just been a, a, a bit too long or it, it's just it's the it's the it's the I would say there are issues with the pacing. It's just the way that she approached the story. Uh, and that was the decision that she consciously made. Um, 
but for me personally, it was slightly a bit too, too slow. But overall, yeah, I think I gave it four out of five stars in the end. If Goodreads allowed me like a percentage, it would be like 4.1, 4.2. But overall, I genuinely enjoyed it and I would pick it up if I had the opportunity. For, mm. What about overall rating, Johnny? What would you give it? Oh, I, because it, it hits quite close to home in places for me, I mean, I live about four miles from the Thames, or the upper course of the Thames. A lot of the places that it describes is very familiar and thematically familiar to me. Yeah. Um, I can, it helps a lot. So I, I, I have to like restrict my rating really a little bit in, in that I'm a bit biased. I mean, it, go ahead, give us it, a biased it, rating. Because I really love the descriptions, <laughs> but that's because I I probably have an easier time imagining some of the things in the book where it describes the bridges, the locks, the, the towns, the pubs, the, the punts on the river. I, I can see it all. Mm-hmm. But someone else that, you know, is not from there might struggle, but it maybe it's that good that everyone ha- loves it. But for me, more like a four point five out of five or okay. if it was a out of ten you know eight point eight nine out of ten i loved it the ending just sold it for me but that's i'm coming off the high of finishing it so you know yeah, fair enough. that rating <laughs> yeah i mean i'm coming off the the high of finishing our next month's book already which i'll, I'll mention at the end of the video but <laughs> we'll talk about that because there's a lot of a lot of stuff there but coming back to this okay so now we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Therefore, if you haven't read the book and, or you don't mind being spoiled, you know, please click off and then come back when you finish to mm. listen to all the ranty bits because uh, it's so much easier to rant than be like official about it and try not to spoil anything. So Johnny, <laughs> put on the rant cap on. It's it's time for the it's time to get uh, to get into it. Mm. And we'll start with favorite and least favorite character and why. Give it to me. Ooh. So favorite character, I think I'm just gonna choose Robert Armstrong. I I thought mm. I I loved his 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 descriptions and his joy that you could tell that he got from the little things and the calming things and uh, you could tell he had a very odd upbringing in life, but it seemed that he was so stoic that he he'd made that a positive for himself. Mm-hmm. And he he made it so he could, he had an understanding for people and animals and the world, and it just seemed like any scene that you were in, he didn't feel like he was in jeopardy at all, mm-hmm. because he just seemed like he understood most things on and people and and how to how to please them and he's so nice so I can't <laughs> you know yeah I can't I can't hate him I love him I just like I want to meet this person. Um, and I thought that his his arc was very captivating, uh, his 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 story and his love for his family and his desire to help out his son. Um, it's very it's very, I suppose it's a, a very time worn story of parents, but in in this case, like sometimes parents think like, I thought I raised my kid right, you know. Yeah. And in in this case, it's kind of like there was definitely not much more. That this man yeah but and he he was it's a very familiar and sad but you know tales all this time of of you they, they feel a bit of guilt about how their their son has turned out or what more could i have done could i have been a better father and you felt that emotion and he was trying his best you know always trying to his best for his son he never gave up on him yeah um, yeah he, he never i did. loved that um, least favorite, uh, don't know. Uh, the, most of the characters in this book are written in such a way that I mean, there's there's dislikable characters. Don't get me wrong. I mean, okay, they're go still with written. Then. <laughs> they're still written well. So dislikable. I didn't like Mrs. Evis, who was the 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 lady that owned yeah. the lodgings that uh, Robin's uh, wife and daughter lived at and she was just rude <laughs> and was very uh, happy to be culpable 
probably for a sum of money in a scheme near the end of the book. I won't say too much, just in case anyone wants to love Lovely and read this book, but we told her to click off. So, yeah, so Donnie, go ahead, <laughs> yeah, spoil no, it away. The, she, she was uh, not not around to, you know, help identify this, this little girl, uh, but perfectly happy once, when probably paid a sum of money to come and be part of a sham show to yeah. make money for uh, Robin to to claim the girl and it's always left open-ended as well about who the girl actually was was it Alice was it you know it definitely wasn't Amelia but <laughs> that's for sure but it's still like it was a lovely story but not didn't like Mrs. Evis uh, and I felt that near the end of the story the sad I... go ahead go ahead i didn't i didn't <laughs> like what happened to mr vaughan's character you okay. could tell that he was a sweet and you know kind man just trying his best and he didn't know the best way to help his wife wasn't quite sure what to do okay, uh, I, I, you could I'm tell gonna... he was guilt ridden the whole time you know i'm gonna I cut felt, you but... off because yeah. that's more of a rant section so like mm. we'll uh, we'll put that into the rant section uh, but I agree with you 100% with uh, Armstrong. I think he definitely was a character that was very easy to like. And it was very comforting whenever you got to his part. Because a lot of the other things there were... Um, like, for example, I personally didn't like the part of uh, Mrs. White. Mm. I thought that was just hard to read. And sometimes I was just so frustrated with her. I wanted to shake her and just be like, just go live at the parsonage you know you have there's an entire paragraph about her going about uh the slippers that she had at the parsonage and how her feet felt nice and warm in them and mm. then she put on her threadbare boots and went home and it was cold and dark and she had no food and it was just frustrating and a little bit painful to read that mm. you kind of emphasize with the character a lot so i wouldn't say I did that was my least favorite character but that was my least favorite kind of plot uh character yeah. plot that I followed uh that was in the book Robert definitely was the was the main one was the was the nicest one because it was just yeah safe and warm and when he I think the little boy's name was Ben when mm. they finally Ben finally reunited with him at his farm I was like yes you know th this uh this lives uh, on is Ben is my favorite character, actually. So I'm, I'm changing it. I, I, when I read that bit, I was like, "This man is an absolute G." <laughs> he is. Well, he went to London and back. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually escaped <laughs> and yeah, brought back girl, Alice. Yeah. Like I was like, "Man, that's amazing yeah. for a little boy." <laughs> yeah, I mean, because uh, so it wasn't Amelia. I mean, Amelia. Right, I, I guess character-wise, that would be it. I mean, also, least favorite character. No, that's easy. Least favorite character is the actual, it was uh, Nathan Nash, whatever his name was, the father of Robin. Oh, Victor Nash, yeah. The, yeah, Victor the, Nash, the, there we go. That's least the favorite character. Absolute Brandy bastard. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> he absolute was... scumbag. Real well-written scumbag, but still, like... You are scum. <laughs> yeah, it was. You it, enjoy abusing people. Who loves you? Who yeah. hurt you? What happened with your life? I mean, it was uh, it was it was just painful to read. And when he came back for Robin, uh, which you know was living with uh, with uh, Armstrong. Well, you know Armstrong raised him as as his own, and it was hmm. all like. I mean, also okay, Robin. Bruh, what are okay? I feel like we're getting into the into the rant. Dumb, dumb. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we're getting into the rant territory, so therefore I'm gonna cut it off and say let's go with favorite scenes and, and least favorite scenes, if we have any, and then go just straight into rant territory with no real structure because I'm just ready to shred Robin to bits for this guy's I don't know, inability to ask a question after the age of eight. <laughs> like mm. but yes, um, Favorite, least favorite scene, if you have any. Um, favorite scenes. Um, as I said, I, I love a lot of the scene setting in the book because yeah. I could picture it all in my head. Um, yeah. But 
the favorite bits that come to mind would be either the arguably a lot of the content at the initial first chapter of the in- interior of the swan mm-hmm. these you know mm-hmm. six six or seven uh, you know drinkers margo margo's a great character i love the, the, <laughs> yeah. the landlady and 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 the people at the house as well little jonathan and like then th- and basically i could picture all of what was going on like them having the body on the table and and being like are they alive who are they and they're d- discussing things and they're sharing their stories of like oh Mel, it kind of looks like uh the stevensons from up the up the farm up the way and stuff yeah, like that i was like yeah. i can just picture this dialogue it's no nothing's forced nothing's nothing's uh you know very convenient like i just know who this is it's yeah. like that it's just them guessing um and i really liked the the fair mm-hmm. which they described where it's like it had been raining during the summer very british you know we get like five days of good sunshine a year in the summer and then everything goes to pot um, authentic description five out of five around the summer solstice it's always like ah, it's gonna be sunny no no it won't be and then it was like it's it's sunny for one day and i'm like oh my god i know like what that feeling is and yeah. then everyone get, picks up because they're like yeah. actually we could put the ch- chairs out we could do things and then the description of the fair because i've been to a few i was like i could see it all i was like just these stands walking through but then the pace that they described and the agitation i was like mm. like it was an intriguing scene it felt tense whilst yeah. jovial and i was like that's that's unique they don't usually do that like yeah. for scene setting usually a tense scene is a bit panicked as well like there's or it's an awful place to be no it's a lovely place to be whilst tense things are happening yeah like, oh. yeah true um and finally i really liked the, the little side plot of 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 mr daunt and uh rita they went to uh trick laid and they went to um head to um see the old uh, old uh old lady that had seen dragons yeah and that was actually my favorite that that's actually my favorite describing because i could picture it all her her picturing what it was like to be in the fire and stuff but then just them sitting in the garden having a cup of tea i was like i could see this and then they've got little jars of honey and then people around and the little girl and i was like mm, this is great i could see all of this yeah but yeah it felt quite a warming touching bit of the book yeah my favorite scene is just as you mentioned it was exactly that one one because it's so british that because i lived in the uk for a while so this was very very easy for me to picture but i also genuinely enjoyed the elements of magical realism that was there because she was telling this entire story about how she'd seen these uh dragons when she was a child and this is you know how she uh like experienced the fire etc and when she was lying on her back because they tipped her into a, a huge vat of water wasn't it or something um, right, they put her in the honey store it, yes they put yeah. her in the honey store to because to she was on fire yeah. yeah so she looked up and she saw tiny flying reptiles which weren't even reptiles she said they didn't have claws they so didn't they were have like wavy lines yeah. across the sky uh, that... across the sky yeah Ooh. so it was really interesting to think what exactly that could have been because again mm-hmm. the i feel like the entire book plays on this might be might not be so there's Mm. a lot of if not all of the things that happened have a real life explanation for it but it also adds just a little bit of that extra like for example when we have quietly you know quietly all around quietly being the way that he was um and on top of that it was the um the little daughter which turns out that the the little the girl was the daughter of quietly uh, and mm. how jonathan who wasn't able to tell a story so the only thing he could tell was the truth all of a sudden talked about quietly and the little girl and the mm. punt across the river and everybody going well this must be true then right or this this has something has to have been like that mm. for him to see it um so with the dragons i think that was just such a nice detour that was the pocket of warmth that i was actually lacking a lot of the book was lacking for me like the the book seemed very very wet to me 
um mm. but that was a pocket of warmth that i really really enjoyed yeah um but for least favorite scene i don't think i have one in i mean i know least favorite scenes as in which were hard to read for me and by not hard it was just like i'm ready to go on from this and that was again with miss uh with mrs white i just mm-hmm. didn't enjoy it that was victor nash is a bastard <laughs> yeah and uh that was not enjoyable that felt like i had to suffer alongside the character which again fair enough that's what the reader should be you know doing mm-hmm. and experiencing but at some point it was kind of like i'm done <laughs> this was uh, i i'm i'm kind of done because with everybody else there seems like to be a little you know, light at the end of the tunnel, even with the wife. Yeah. Um, although with her, it was, uh, there were some points where I was like, this is going to break and shatter and her happiness is so fragile. And I really, mm. really hope that she's just not going to implode. And this is not going to, you know, be a massive catastrophe. So she had, like the worst case of postpartum depression <laughs> I've ever read. <laughs> of just... Yeah denial and uh, but i i would agree the the comfortable like the most uncomfortable like least favorite scene i guess is just listening to the one of the first encounters that we read of 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 lily and in her basket basket maker's cottage yeah um, that the you could picture victor talking to her whilst you know He's in the dark and you can't see him. It's just a, a threatening voice of just like, so do you have the stuff? Like, you know what happens the last time this happened and stuff yeah. like that. And, and you're like, I don't like this. <laughs> it makes you feel really uncomfortable. And it dragged on you like you just want to slap some sense into this woman and be like, stand up for yourself. Do something. Yeah. This guy's yeah. awful. Don't don't bend to him. But I suppose it's definitely well picturing. You know, yeah. someone that has been abused, and I mean, he of, he he fooled life. her. He made yeah. her think that she drowned her own sister. And that was and when it, he was a little boy as well. That was when he was supposedly like a teenager, and she was really young. Yeah, it's a t- yeah. truly awful person. Really. Yeah, the the little piglet, and they couldn't find the the child, and so. I, I, I mean when I read that I was I was horrified at first mm. I thought that she actually did do it yeah and I was like that would that would have been awful like, poor Lily. because and then because yeah she's been led to believe that and the parson found out from the people and I was like oh my god it's yeah. so depressing <laughs> yeah I mean Victor Nash is just whew, this prime man. bastard awful yeah but which makes me segue really nicely <laughs> into the rant section, mm. which uh, I'm going to start with Robin. And what the heckity heck was Robin thinking? Reading a letter when he was eight and then deciding, you know what, I'm never going to question this or ask anybody of this or do anything about it. Because for all of his pompousness, for all of his, you know, self-serving um, kind of characterization I actually didn't understand this he was so self-serving that I would think that he would check he would be immediately do something to verify the information that he read yeah instead he doesn't and he grows up believing that he is the son of the earl and you know doesn't know the true information that it's his dad and he yeah, I feel like there's kind of a disconnect because I feel like as somebody who would be super, super self-serving, they would go to great lengths to make sure that they have their fingers on, on all the pulses they could, they could possibly have. And he would definitely be trying to get in contact with the Earl or with the, you know, his mother, like supposed, well, I mean, he thinks his mother is his mother, but, you know, some sort of connection. Instead, it was just... Mm. a huge assumption and i feel like maybe that was probably the weakest part of the book is that there's this massive assumption that this guy didn't you know held on to a belief after he was you know since he was eight years old and he was 23 now i feel He's like a, a massive yeah. dumb dumb he was it was a bit of a leap yeah i feel like they played it off like 
he stole something from the drawer and happened to glance at the letter and read it and then yeah. like had to like close up quickly and thought I'd never get access to that letter ever again. It'll be hidden the next time. So like and he just took that at face value. Never thought about it, never thought about the fact that his dad is also called Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Like, where do you think his dad yeah. comes from? <laughs> or why do you think he has money and stuff like that? It's one and one is three. That is how that goes together, mm. definitely. Either way, absolute numpty. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I definitely don't really understand some of his decision making. Being yeah. such a, it makes you think that this Victor chap. When he, you know, he describes everything near the end mm-hmm. of the book, that he's probably had his hand in Robin's life a lot more than it is implied. Yeah, uh, that he's been at the center of his gambling issues and things, and and at the Green Dragon in Oxford. If that's a real place, I'm Where sorry, Green Dragon. It was a horrible pub from the sounds of things, but I'm sure it's lovely if it's real. <laughs> Yeah, I would hope so. I would hope so. Certainly hope the swan at Radcot is real. I want to go there. <laughs> this field trip, definitely. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. He his motivations were a little bit flimsy in that regard. Yeah. I definitely think he would have checked. I think the second thing that I have an issue with character wise, and I think this ties down really, really well with author like problem with the author and I think you know where I'm getting at which is my main one of my main gripes with the book and where I docked probably the most points from it and that is Rita Mm. I think Rita is an excellent character she is strong she's clever she climbed as far as she could go at that time in those circumstances Uh, she was essentially a doctor without any of the certification which the book mentions it just goes on and says well you know everybody understood that Rita knew her stuff and in the end they all went to her and she did plenty of deliveries and helped up with helped with all the ailments of all the townsfolk and the village folk etc and then the end of the book comes along and says you know what you know what she decides to not do anything else for the rest of her life or because Mm. there's a very specific phrase that happens and that is if I remember correctly her talking to Henry when the cottage is flooded and she's trying to save all the books and she goes and looks at it and says I think I've reached I I think I've done everything that I could possibly do and learned everything I could possibly do so she acknowledges the ceiling Mm -hmm. or perceived ceiling and the next thing we know she's pregnant and she was a character who was one of her main defining features was that that she was a nurse who was terrified of pregnancy because she saw pregnancy and what it did to a woman both during childbirth and during the pregnancy itself and Mm. she was just afraid of it and the thing is a lot of women then and now have similar feelings towards pregnancy you might want a child but the pregnancy itself is terrifying and Mm. I felt that in the end what would have been a great lead up especially because she held the little girl and she was like I realize I want to be a mother but you know the pregnancy is the thing that's scaring me they would have gone for adoption or they would have gone to an orphanage and it would have really tied down to that theme where orphanages played a role because that was where a Ben was in and you know it would have tied it down to the theme of the book Mm. instead (laughs) nope she's pregnant and she's not going to be a nurse anymore or do anything because she's going to be Henry Don's wife and because it it does actually pose a problem because Henry lives on a boat like effectively when he's working so if she would go with him which I would assume she would they would both be on this boat with this little child and she would definitely not be you know nursing or doing anything like that or actively trying to I don't know. I I felt like it was a very, you know, propagating this sense of that's still you find in a lot of modern literature, which is still like, I will never find the meaning of life without having a child, which, you know, fair enough. It is definitely as a compliment, but it should not be your life, Mm. I think. That is my stance as a woman. So I think maybe this is where I'm coming from, but 
yeah, Rita was actually my biggest problem and the way her story got resolved in this book and I'm really upset. So I went back and uh, reread like so sort of the the ending part of that and mm. I do agree. Like the language used makes it sound like she doesn't want to to learn more. I don't know whether they they left it sort of open ended about what their future would entail. They just sort of that they'd have kid. They 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 were heavily pregnant. Yeah. Attended. They got married. It described them getting married. But I feel like um. I don't know whether they they'd live on the boat or not. I'm not <laughs> sure. I think that he would travel for work along the Thames because his his life goal was was to to photograph the um the source to the you know the mouth of the Thames and yeah. and the the sort of story of the river and it's based on a real person um it was called like Henry Taunt oh um and the the author writes a sort of passage about him at the back of the book oh yes um, yes yes you're right and I feel like most of his life was spent you know going up and down getting pictures but then coming home for long periods and Mm-hmm. choosing the best photos and making write it up writing up stories i feel like rita would have continued to be a nurse of sorts for the village but to say that she couldn't learn more was a bit of a odd one and then yeah i don't i don't understand the shift of decision making i thought like they they they'd come to a lovely compromise and you know i i find that at least it wasn't like being pressured into it yeah but then so so Rita herself made the decision, but it still felt a bit like, well, hang on a minute. I thought that you'd, you you had such a, a terrifying fear of of, of 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 childbirth and you'd seen so many that you don't want to have to have it happen to yourself. Why the switch? Yeah. We've, all, we've all explored the story, like uh, the theme throughout the book about picking up a, a child and, 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 and realizing that you want to care for them no matter where they came from. Exactly. And Robin as well. Robin as well is another one of those, I picked up a child and he's not my child of blood. And then Rita, all of a sudden, it has to be, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm lacking as well. I'm going to like, there. a train of thought did uh, cross my mind about the fact that I am not versed in the contraceptive methods that were available to women a hundred years ago. So Mm -hmm. I guess that would be the only reason to like think what how that would happen against her own character development but Mm. even then i think i i i don't know because then it just makes it seem like you're giving up i again being a woman throughout history has not been easy and maybe this is one of those situations where there was you know lesser evil type of thing so yeah who knows but i feel yeah. like i suppose they are made up characters so we don't really know <laughs> whether they were happy or not but um yeah. the i did feel that the uh, uh henry and rita acted as excellent focal points for the the reader mm. uh going from like a modern day logical perspective into the mystery the and the and the magical aspects of the story of like you know what could have done this? Was it was it the ghost? Was it this? Was yeah. it, you know, and they were they were always the rational sort of uh, puzzle solving side of things, yeah. and then going, well, how can we get the answers to this? And I, I sort of loved the the description of scientific method and and other mm-hmm. things and how they could use illusions and how they could use a story to then sew a story to those that are of more of a fantastical sort of uh persuasion of like Mm -hmm. of where the girl came from and that ruby was innocent and it was this fortune telling uh pig owner that was the problem and they helped absolve ruby i love that part i was like that's great because they knew that they were kind of sewing a narrative that used magic but they they knew that the magic wasn't real they were like but yeah but it will it will become a story to these people yeah. um and so then they'll not have any judgment reserved for ruby anymore yeah which it, that's what they described that she had stigma like 
and people wouldn't give her a job because they thought that she stole children and stuff like that, which wasn't true. And it's, I thought that was fascinating how stories can be positive and negative, I guess. I think you bring up um, actually my third major gripe with the book. Um, and that was, so we had Ruby. That's how I segued into that. And we know that eventually we find out that Amelia is actually dead. <laughs> she was drowned, uh, no longer yeah. alive. Child is, is definitely, the, the girl is definitely not Amelia. Ah, she's a ghost. And <laughs> then we find out the story of what actually happened with her. And I think, I think what the book re does really, really well is that if you look back, and which I'm doing now, kind of reflecting upon it, it really ties, it, it threads the the threads together very, mm. very well. Like the separate story threads are actually, you know, how Henry Daunt, he took photos of the various different things that then come into play. Mm. Um, then we have obviously Armstrong and the pig. Uh, so Maud, how she ends up with uh, Mrs. White with Lily, and then how Lily is, you know, with Nash, with Victor Nash. Victor Nash is Robin's dad, and how that all interplays and is interrelated. And I really appreciate that, but. Are you telling me somebody could really pretend for two years <laughs> that their child isn't dead? <laughs> like, what's so... I mean, again, maybe, and if there are any psychology students that will ever watch this, you can kind of elucidate us uh, and tell us if that is actually possible for somebody to just block out or fool yourself into thinking that this is not your child. Um, I mean, I think especially for the wife, I, I was very skeptical when I found did, out that she... She was never told. Was no, he Mr. told her. I Mr. mean, Mr. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. he yeah, never Mr. explicitly Mr. told her. Went, like, uh, no, I, they, they took the money. They didn't give Amelia back, you know. Yeah, no, uh, but she did say that she suspected it all along, but hmm. she was just never told. I mean, I guess, but... Again, you know, it's your child. I would assume, again, it's it's kind of that assumption that you would never ask when you, I think so many, because uh, a, a bit of a segue, but Alex and I like to watch uh, Unsolved Mysteries, which is on Netflix. Great show. Uh, it's a, a lot of it is obviously about, you know, child kidnappings and murders, etc., which are, you know, the main cases that we have kind of in today's world. And all the distraught mothers, when they lose their children, there was an episode about it. All of them immediately started questioning absolutely everybody. The thing that they did, they, did, they didn't hide in on themselves and say, okay, we're not doing anything. All of them ran around trying to find this child, phoned absolutely everybody they could. You know, they, they took an active part in trying to get their child back. And therefore, I don't really believe that if your husband comes back, doesn't say anything, that you wouldn't be on his case being like, so what happened? Where is it? Tell me. And then not go out and look for that kid yourself. I think mm. that is that is the kind of second part of the book where you have to... It, it's a bit of a stretch, in my opinion, but I don't know what you think. I think the... I suppose you have to think of the logistical constraints of of but they described that they that they they had that big project to make distill brandy make a distillery on the island they their their money situation was a little fraught they still had money but they were and then the logistical you know standpoint of back then there's no cars there's no you can you can mount another enough people on horseback and ride to various towns. I mean, have you seen this person? Descriptions. It's a search back then for a missing person yeah. must have been a lot harder. Um, and yeah, I feel like they could have done more to describe the events of you know what happened just after the kidnapping, mm -hmm. and you know the denial of Mister Vaughan. I feel like it required a little bit more description because initially you think that did he drown them? Like, yeah. whereas it's no, no, it's uh, what what he came across 
was Amelia's corpse. Yeah, she wasn't actually and, drowned. I, I need to stand corrected. Yeah, she and that he did not recognize her, but she said like he had their clothes, their necklace, and stuff. But it wasn't my Amelia, and he like placed the the body back into the into the river. Um, and you're like, Jesus, did he drown his kid? by accident like what the <laughs> fuck? and then like late later on you then find out no no so that was amelia but she'd been killed like a few hours before this like yeah, but being dropped quite a while ago, by getting dropped on the head falling in the river but that blow probably killed her and then she drowned yeah. or you know there's no way of resuscitating her and then they fished her out of the river after like 10 minutes and then had this body in a bag and so maybe you know it's sort of believable that you know a a face and what happens to a body you know immediately after they die in the hours preceding like yeah preceding it um it starts to look unfamiliar the facial structure will fail you know and so it's kind of half believable that it made it focused some denial in in this in Mr. Vaughan, he was like, I don't want to believe my child's dead. That might yeah. have been a child dressed as my child, but not mine. And they wanted to pass it off. And, you know, but he knew, but he'd repressed it. Yeah. Yeah. And then sowed the lie to his wife and in the means of thinking it would spare her or something. You know, it, yeah. it, it was just a tragic, tragic series of of thinking you're doing the right thing mentally or maybe this will help us mourn or you know no you need to mourn properly yeah no yeah by ripping the band-aid off and yeah that was your kid tell your wife (laughs) tell it always tell your wife moral of the story (laughs) you know you know that she's fragile and whatever but it's the the mental scarring that it and i I loved that the description of, of Miss Constantine, mm-hmm. who was clearly like the early version of a therapist. Yeah. And yeah. that and then the psychotherapy and stuff. And I, I loved that she was like, I can help. And and he misconstrued that as like initially yeah. like, mm-hmm. you know, fortune telling wizardry, like just like, okay, I need you to sow an idea in her mind, use some mental trickery. He's like, No, I don't do that. I just help people break down their trauma and yeah i love that they came to an understanding on that like later in the book and i was like yeah. that's nice yeah. no one likes them they've made a friend <laughs> so johnny would mm. you recommend the book wholeheartedly i love okay. this book yeah but it's very specific you got to read it at the right time if you're looking for bingey books this isn't a binge book if you yeah. want a fiction to just snap uh you know 10 pages every day go like oh what happens next and then put it down go i need some sleep i gotta work tomorrow yeah but then you pick it up the next day and you can keep going this is more of a dedicate sittings to it an hour at a time yeah get through a few pages enjoy the storytelling let it weave you in picture yourself in the places it's very much that sort of uh you know rhythmical old-fashioned tale yeah feels quite well rounded at the end yeah so definitely recommend this book but choose the correct time to read it yeah i completely agree with everything you said and i would also say that if you've lived in the uk and no longer are living there i would recommend this because as somebody who's done that it really did bring back a lot of the feelings and emotions and kind of imagery that i that you experience yourself when you're there um especially living for an extended period of time so would recommend for that as well um but yeah that would also be my (laughs) my thoughts on the book and now we get to talk a little bit about our expectations for january's pick of the month which i can't really participate in wholeheartedly because i already finished the book so you can probably tell how i how i feel about it and that is six of crows we finally picked up booktube's baby and decided to read and see what it was all about what are your expectations now that you've already spoken to me a bit about it and you know how i felt about it at the beginning Mm -hmm. and how i feel about it now because at the beginning i felt very skeptical uh as i do with a lot of the the youtube big ones 
Um, but I definitely think that it does deserve the hype that it gets. I feel like from what I know about the book so far, um, I'm, I'm prepared. I've got, got you know, a low, low bar, you know, but I'm, I'm hoping that it, it clears the bar. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's going to be, I know it's about a heist. Yeah. And I, I've watched a lot of heist movies. Yeah. Some of them are really bad or very <laughs> coincidental. Yeah. Like, oh, this just happened to be here. This yeah. handy key. You know, like, oh, okay. <laughs> very contrived. But um the I'm I'm ready to be wholeheartedly, you know, sold by the characters and I, the drama of it, because that sounds like what people rave about the yeah. The, whilst you know the setting and the character the, the, the naming and stuff like that can be a bit off-putting the yes me at the beginning being like i don't like how this sounds she's taken so much from just borrowing lots of european culture and yeah. other worldly bits uh but if it's good it's good i'll give it a read uh i'll save my hype i'm going into it blind so i haven't looked up any yeah like major reviews or anything i'm just like i want to just read this like an old-fashioned fiction book just me as a teenager sitting in bed going just binging a book you know yeah i want to want to see what what it's like yeah well i've already done so i'm waiting for you to finish and if we have enough time we will also consider finishing the actual duology both in january depending on how fast you're, you're going through it and uh, as well as some of the other members of the book club but if you feel also like you want to join in you know where to find us there's a link to the discord in the in the box below and you can join and chat about six of crows once upon a river uh and a darker shade of magic which is the three things that we've read so far and decide help us decide what we should read for the next month mm. and uh <laughs> <laughs> what we should uh, venture into genre wise uh, but yes thank you johnny for another lovely lovely discussion i i'm really enjoying these so it's it's great to have this uh this time with you um thank you all for watching if you've gotten all the way to the end and we will see you next month with six of crows or the entire six of crows theology and that is going to be mm -hmm. a wild ride i can already promise you that so we will see you all then. Bye-bye. Happy New Year.